Thank you very much. And uh, can you all hear me? Great. Okay. So it's a big pleasure for me to be here today. First of all, because Singapore is a wonderful place. It's always a pleasure coming here. I come here quite regularly. And I had to laugh when I arrived on Monday, arriving from Denmark. You can probably imagine Denmark. It's very cold at this time of year. Something like zero degrees, minus a few degrees, a little bit of snow, a lot of rain, very humid, very, very cold. I'm arriving in Singapore, getting into the taxi, the first thing the taxi driver says, ooh, it's so cold. And then <laughs> getting to my hotel, getting out on the street, people are wearing coats and saying, yeah, it's just 25 degrees. It's just a hilarious place. So it's great to be here, and I'll take off my coat now. <laughs> But I'm also happy to be here uh, at this event today because it's fantastic to see so many people apparently being interested in this topic of bringing mindfulness into the working life. The first conference that I attended, actually I organized it myself because back then no one were interested in mindfulness in the, in the work life. So I had to organize it myself. It's some six years ago in Denmark. And we paired up with the biggest business newspaper in Denmark and they advertised and it was just all over the place. 70 people turned up. And <laughs> here, Jochen just puts it in the newsletter and a little bit more, and then we have 250 people in the room. Now, that's very encouraging for me to see that the world is actually opening up to something that Jochen and Jay and Lauren will talk about how it's actually has been having a, a big business but also personal benefits. So before I start, I also just like to share another little anecdote. I'm a man of anecdotes. Hope you don't mind because I'm standing here as kind of an authority on mindfulness in the corporate space because I developed or co-developed this organization which is now in, in 10, 20 countries and working with blue chip companies all around the world. But it didn't start like that. It started with me having my first job in an organization. I had to present mindfulness and I had been studying and teaching mindfulness for already some 15 years back then. And I was really, really excited because all this stuff that I had learned that had meant so much to me and changed my life, I was going to present this to a group of people who were busy. And I came into the room and for the whole morning, I had them for a full day, for the whole morning I was just talking and sharing and putting them down on, a, on their bums to do their mindfulness training. And after lunch break, no one came back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, we're laughing now. Back then it was very painful, so don't laugh too much. <laughs> but the learning for me was very, very important, as painful as it was, because it taught me that the way that mindfulness is normally presented and the way I learned it, and the way I taught it back then, did not really you know, apply with the way people are working in very busy life nowadays. So I had to spend quite some years putting together researchers, mindfulness masters, and business leaders from around the world to put together a program that kind of worked, that took mindfulness, which is often something we do at home in our private life, and then, you know, corporate, organizational, busy, busy life, two different things, to put that together. And that has obviously taken some years, and here we are today, and having a big conference, and there are other people around the world doing this job, so that's why it's a big pleasure for me being here today. Thank you for showing up, and I'll be talking for something like 15 minutes. Please stay just for those 15 minutes so it won't break my heart. Okay, great. So I'm going to, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to say a few things. I'm first going to like introduce what is the rationale? Why, is, why does mindfulness even make sense in, in a busy work life? We already have enough to do. And then I'm just briefly going to uh, give a recipe on how can it be implemented. That was what I was asked to talk about. How can it be trained in organizations? And I'm going to come with three points, three things that I think are from our experience working all over the world with mindfulness that is needed. And one of them is basically daily training. So I'm also going to put you through a little five-minute mindfulness training. So before you leave this room, you will have done it. You know what it is. Okay? Then we can start the talk. No more anecdotes. So the big question is, why do companies like the ones you see up here, why do they use mindfulness? Why do they use mindfulness as a tool for their employees and their leaders? And I guess there are many answers to this. And one of them that I've come up with after talking to leaders of many of these companies is that no matter where we go, whether it's Europe, whether it's Asia, whether it's Australia or it's North America, 
people are experiencing something that we have named the paid world. Anud just referred to what is called the VUCA world, which is a term from the is that 70s or 80s. We have come up with a slightly different version of that, which we think quite uh, precisely describes some of the things or characteristics of a modern work life. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you can recognize these four components here. The first one is people in daily work life nowadays feel like they're under some kind of pressure. How many feel like you're under pressure when you're at work? Not everyone. That's nice. Great. I want to move to Singapore. <laughs> Many people find that they're always on, you know, with their iPhones or smartphones and laptops, iPads, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. How many feel like you're always on when you're at work and sometimes at home as well? Third one, information overloaded. So much information that we have to you know, deal with all the time. Some people already have their hands up. <laughs> Great. And the last one, being living in a distracted environment, being at work and there are just tons of distractions around. Again, from all kinds of gadgets, electronic gadgets and people around us. How many feel like the world is distracted nowadays? Okay. So those of you who are not practicing mindfulness, and who can like, relate to this, mindfulness may be a good tool for you. Because these organizations that we saw before, they are using mindfulness because they see their employees and leaders are actually living this, what we call paid reality, paid world. And it can be quite tough. It has some consequences to our well-being and to our performance. And we're going to look a little bit into that and thereby talk about why is it mindfulness works. So basically, to put it in a different way, Work life has changed radically over the last decades. Just a few decades ago, work life looked a little bit like what you have over here on the left-hand side. Whether you had a typewriter or a dictaphone or a meeting, whatever, it doesn't matter. The essence of it is there was one stream of information coming towards you at any given moment. And nowadays, it's more like over there, whether you have six screens or it's all kinds of gadgets, mobile gadgets, and open office plans, and so on. Lots of information coming to us all the time. And now I have to ask the question, are there anyone in here who feel like you still belong in that paradigm? <laughs> <laughs> I take the laughter for a no. Okay. So then the big and interesting question is, living in that paradigm over there, what is that doing to our brain? It's very simple from a neurological point of view. When the brain is confronted with more than one, so let's say two or six or ten pieces of information at the same time, the brain reacts by trying to solve all of it at that same time. And that's a good word for this. Any good guesses? Multitasking. multitasking. Who said that? Thank you. Multitasking. Yes, that's the word. So we start to multitask, and that's the way the world works nowadays. We multitask, and we even encourage to multitask. However, there's been done a lot of research on multitasking. And <laughs> some people are just, no, no, no. <laughs> we don't know, want to know where this is going. Before I go to the next slide, are there any good multitaskers in the room? <laughs> are there any proud multitaskers? Is that a better question? <laughs> there's one up there. <laughs> Okay, great. So there's been done a lot of research on multitasking and its consequences for our well-being and our performance. And I'll just put it up here. It's not a good picture. That's why I made it red for you. Red means alarming, right? Uh, <laughs> the biggest research study was done on Stanford, and they set out, they spent quite a few years with the intention of finding the benefits of multitasking. After a few years, there was a reporter who came to this research and he said, so what did you find? What are the benefits of multitasking? And you just saw Yoke, and you know researchers, they're quite conservative, and they don't really just say their results like that. But this researcher, he said, we found nothing, not one single benefit, but we did find a number of downsides. These are some of them. So we are less efficient. We have less overview, meaning we are less good at prioritization. It reduces our well-being. It decreases the quality of what we're doing. It hampers our creativity, it drains our energy. And the most important one is that when we're doing this, it's basically rewiring our brain so it becomes our default way of working. Meaning we become really great multitaskers. Meaning that we become really great at being very little efficient, having little overview, being very little creative, and so on. 
That's just a very brief overview. There are some really good articles around this, and I'm happy to send out these articles to anyone who's interested in it. Right. So that was like multitasking. It's not the best thing in the world. There is a more fundamental downside of this paid world, which is we're basically losing our ability to pay attention to what we're doing right here, right now. And there was research that was published in the Harvard Business Review a few years ago by Edward Hallowell. He had gone into organizations and he had been looking at people's ability to pay attention. And what he could see is that over the last 20 years, the ability to pay attention has dropped radically. He calls it attention deficit trait. The inability to pay attention for a longer time, period of time, whether it's to an email or it's a conversation or a meeting or any kind of task, our mind goes all over the place, losing the ability to pay attention. Hmm. There's been done other research looking at, so how much is our attention actually impaired? How often is our mind wandering away from the present moment? So like when we're writing an email or in a meeting, imagine yourself in a meeting in your company, how often is your mind present and how often is it wandering away? And the result is a little bit shocking. It comes here published in Science a few years ago again. 46.9% of our waking hours, our mind is not present with what we're doing. But basically just involuntarily wandering off in past or in future, in east and in west, everywhere else than where we are right now. And that's a result of the paid world, which leads us to multitask, basically losing the ability to pay attention. Okay. Who were the proud multitaskers? <laughs> okay, great. So it's a little bit like this. This is what the, the modern mind looks like. We're sitting at work Monday morning trying to do this very important email, thinking about golf. Someone who can recognize this? And now all the... <laughs> Thanks, Toby. <laughs> um, now all the women are laughing because this is men, but I think it's the same for women. Anyway, finally John, you know, he's getting to play his golf and he's thinking of his wife or whoever it is, we don't really know, and finally getting to have this dinner with the wife and thinking back at work. <laughs> so that's really just a great analogy for what the mind is like nowadays. Okay. This was the burning platform. This is why we maybe need some kind of tools that can help us to harness the attention to stay present with emails, with meetings, with tasks, and with our children when we come home, and our spouses for that matter. But the good news is, and here's a video, and now I want to hypnotize you all. This is so beautiful, isn't it? This is basically what the brain looks like from the inside. And now we are turning to the good news. Because the good news is coming from neuroscience. Neuroscience is telling us that we can actually change. This is the brain from the inside. It has about 100 billion neurons, which are these balls, and it's connected by 5,000 5, synapses. We'll just put it on again. And <laughs> it's a huge network up there. And basically everything we're doing and saying and thinking and experiencing leaves tracks in our brain in form in the shape of, of neural networks, connections up there. So every time we're doing something with our brain, we're actually creating physiological connections in the brain. Which basically means we're free to change. We're not bound to lose our ability to pay attention. We can retrain that ability to be focused with whatever we're doing right here and right now. That's the good news. Does that sound okay? Right. So that leads us to mindfulness training. What is mindfulness training? And Mindfulness training is going back 2,500 years, as you probably know, and it's been researched thousands of times. So I'll just give you a very brief uh, definition here. Basically, mindfulness training is learning to manage our attention so that our attention is not wandering off into rumination or negative thoughts or things that we don't need right now, but really staying present in the moment because that's all we have is this present moment. So if we are not present in the moment, we're wasting out of our life. So that's basically what mindfulness is. Very short definition. Learning to manage the mind. And to put it in a more simple way, it's basically the same as going to the gym for our muscles. We go there because we want a stronger body so that we can walk the stairs and be healthy in life. 
Mindfulness training, a little bit similar. It's just inside the brain, in the mind. It's the mind we're training. Yeah. Right. And now I'm told there's five minutes left, <laughs> which is a great thing because we're almost done. So this was like the first answer or the answer to the first question, which is why mindfulness in work life? There's so much to do already. And the answer is very simple. We're living in a stressful world, lots of information, the paid reality. And that is impairing our attention. So we cannot do our jobs well. We get stressed, we get burnout. We cannot pay attention when we come home. That's why we need mindfulness, because that's the training of learning to regain that ability to really being present, despite all the chaos and busyness. So that was the first question. The second one is, okay, how do we implement this? How do we introduce it in organizations? And we've been doing this for a number of years, and as I mentioned, almost all over the world, not so much in Africa and Alaska, but many other places. We will go to Alaska, I'm sure. They are catching a lot of, uh, what's that? fish up there. We want them to do it mindfully so the fish are not suffering unnecessary. Anyway, we've been doing it all over the place and, and we have gained some experience in what works and definitely what doesn't work as you heard from my first anecdote. So three things that we have found is very important. Actually four things. The first one is not up here but that is this is no quick fix. It takes time. So time, dedication, resources is needed if you really want to see a difference. I'm not talking more about that. But specifically, how do you do, what do you need? You need three things. You need some kind of daily training that people who you're introducing this to, to, whether it's at leadership level or employee level, that people are actually doing this training. It's not a theory, it's a training. It's a, you know, sit down, do that training. We experience 10 minutes has really good results. I think, Jochen, you're going to present some of the results on our program as well, yeah. So what he's going to show is based on 10 minutes a day. It's not a lot. And I'm going to guide through this training in, in a few minutes. The other thing that is needed is some mindful strategies. Basically, mind strategies for coping with a world that is, you know, under pressure, always on, and so on. And I'm going to say just a few words about that, but not that much. And then work-life applications. And I'll say a bit more about those as well. And I'll start with those. Work-life applications. It's very, very important to take mindfulness and apply it to what we are doing. If it's just 10 minutes a day, sitting on a chair or a cushion somewhere, it has limited effects. It's very important to take it into work life and the challenges. And specifically, how do we apply this when we are faced with our inbox that is just you know, piling up, piling up more and more emails and our way of returning on those emails? Also, how do we use it in meetings? So really, from a mindfulness perspective, best practice tips on applying mindfulness in work-life situations. That is very important. And we do it in all kinds of ways, like even from goal-setting, prioritization, planning, and so on. There are many, many applications of this. But that is key, to put it into work-life. The second one, again, as we spoke about the mindful strategies, here are some of the eight basic fundamental strategies that underpins this whole tradition of mindfulness. You're very welcome to make a lot of photos. You're also welcome to give me your email address and I'll be happy to forward you these, uh, these slides afterwards. Um, so you can see them out there. Basically, these are all strategies for dealing with a world that is busy, that is crazy, in a way that we feel better about it and we do it in a more efficient way so we're not wasting our time. That's a very short description of it. And the opposite of all of these eight is basically coming from the reptilian brain, which is a weird part of the brain that is doing all kinds of funny things to us, makes us do all kinds of funny things in work life. These are the opposites, the antidotes. Right. And then the last thing that is needed, as I mentioned, is the daily training. And I'm going to end on this one and guide you through just a few minutes of this mindfulness training so you have experienced it. Does that sound okay? Yeah. So I'm just going to take a few minutes of guiding you into it and there'll be a few minutes of silence and then I will not ring a bell because I don't have a bell but I will just say that you can open your eyes again so if you're all ready I'll stand up 
So I'm inviting you to find a comfortable posture on your chair. It's a good thing to have earth connection, so keep your feet on the ground, sitting in balance. And maintain a straight back. Close your eyes. Breathe through your nose. And take just a moment to allow your body to settle. Relax. Specifically in your shoulders, in your neck, your arms. And then turn your full attention to the experience of your breath at the nostrils. And just sit and observe, pay attention to this experience of air flowing in and air flowing out. In breath followed by out breath. While you're doing that, every time you're breathing out, count. So the first out breath, one, second one, two. You count up to 10, and then you reverse and count down to one again. And the last instruction, every time you find that you get distracted by any thought, any sound, any sensation, just notice that you're distracted. And in a gentle way, return your full attention to the breath and continue counting. And we'll sit like this in silence for a few minutes. And so now in your own pace, you can let go of the breath and open your eyes and return your attention to this room. So I imagine this was the first time that some 250 people at SMU sitting still doing mindfulness training together. I'm very honored to have been given the honor of guiding that, so thank you very much. Um, it's of course a very old tradition, there's a lot of teachings to it. This was really just scratching the surface of the surface. Um, but this was a basic, the basic methodology, really harnessing the attention on a specific object. So when we learn to do that, we can do the same when we're doing an email or with our children, whatever we are doing. And for every moment we're doing this training, we're creating those neural connections in our brain, which gives a stronger attention, a stronger attention muscle, so we can do the same in all life situation. That's basically what it is, the very fundamental of it. Okay. So I would just like to end on a more soft note. As Anut said, yeah, this can be seen as a hard skill, but also a very soft skill. I think it's a hard skill, but it has some very soft outcomes. And while in the companies we're normally talking about effectiveness and efficiency and productivity and bottom line, and that's what mindfulness is going to be used for, that is also true. It's giving some of those results. But what is more important to me and which came out with our very first large client that we worked with and still are working with on the fifth year now, he was a sales director in a very large Scandinavian insurance company. And reading his little text here, basically he went into it for himself and his organization because, yeah, I want some more effectiveness, some more bottom line benefits. But in the end, finding that there were some more intangible but more, much more important benefits, which is we become better human beings. And the simple reason is, as we're practicing this, we get this inner peace. We find peace with ourselves. And it's so funny, I don't know if you notice, but when you're really at peace with yourself, it's really hard to make conflicts with others, isn't it? So, so we just make more peace with others as well. So organizations become more wholesome, more easygoing, which is a great thing. So that would be my ending remark of today. 
if anyone would like to know more about this thing that we're doing, at least you can contact on, us on, or you can talk, contact Puyi, who's sitting down there on, on this email address. There's some open programs. If you want to learn more about it, uh, you can go and talk to Puyi. Um, and as I mentioned, if any of you want the reference articles of this, I'm happy to send that out tomorrow. Uh, so also the PowerPoints. So if you like that, come and put your business card maybe down here, so I'll send it out to, to those of you who want that. Right. So those were the words from me for now. So thanks very much for the attention. Did you stay with me for those 20 minutes? Yes. Yes? Okay, thank you.